Hey folks, you hungry? Feeling like a burger? <laughs> Me too. But as we all know, you can't enjoy a classic burger without ketchup. Just like everyone also knows that you can't enjoy a classic slice of pizza without sauce, AKA ketchup. And a drink? If you're watching this video, you probably know all about Food Chain Magnate, the 50s diner simulator where you tactically tank your prices until your friends cry. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm so sorry for that intro. But if you're still here, I've got a separate video that teaches the base game and you should probably watch that first. Anyway, the ketchup mechanism and other ideas brings a whole host of new things to Food Chain Magnate, almost all of which can be used separately. So if you order your burgers sky high with toppings or you just want none pizza with left beef, this expansion's got you covered. And we're gonna go through all of it, but I'm gonna start with what the designers recommend as your first steps, then move on to the easy additions and end with more complex stuff. So without further ado, let's dive in. So like I said, there are two modules that the game recommends you start with, either on their own or together. And I pretty much agree. These are the new milestones and the coffee mod. N not that coffee mod. Millennials know what I'm talking about. Anyway, these are pretty easy to add in, and once you've tried them out, you'll be well equipped to play with any and all other modules. Or if going all in seems like a bit much, there are a number of recommended combo meals to order instead, so there's plenty of options here. Anyway, let's start with the new milestones, which you'll use instead of the old ones. Some of them have either a trigger or an effect in common with the old milestones, whereas others are completely new. And as with the base game, most of these are pretty self-explanatory, so I won't cover all of them in detail. Now, before we get started, place these hard choices tokens on the first marketeer, trainer, and recruiting girl piles. These milestones have to be claimed on turn two, otherwise they're discarded and no one can claim them for the rest of the game. Now let's look at the milestones themselves. In my opinion, the most interesting ones are related to selling food and drinks, because now different items are providing different benefits, which is gonna lead to some new strategies. First burger boosts your CEO, First Pizza creates a two-turn radio pizza ad for each house that bought a pizza that turn. First Lemonade lets you train cards in your structure, provided they stay the same color. First Coke gives you the freezer, which works just like it used to. And First Beer lets you pay your salaried employees with food and drinks instead of money, which is depressing for them, so don't think about it. Next up, we've got a card that boosts early game marketing. The first marketeer you use triggers this milestone, which has two main effects. The first is that you now gain five bucks every time an ad that one of your marketeers created places demand token on a house. You gain this money during the marketing campaigns phase, but if this breaks the bank a second time, the game won't end until after the next dinnertime phase. And the second thing is that when calculating your restaurant's appeal during dinnertime, you subtract two from the distance. If your distance was one or zero, it now counts as negative distance. These people are just magnetically drawn to your very good soda. Okay, there are a few more, so we're gonna do these next ones rapid fire. First campaign manager lets you place a second marketing tile of the same type following normal placement rules, but it has to advertise the same thing. First trainer gets you a second trainer, but they also make it so that if you're flat broke, your employees will take pity on you and you won't have to fire them if you can't pay their salary. If you can pay them though, either with cash or if you have first beer, goods, and you don't, you've abused their trust and they quit. And the last one that needs clarification is the first discount manager. From now on, every time any player who holds this milestone discounts by three bucks or more, a hundred dollars gets removed from the bank. Which is an effect that when I first saw it, made me say something that I'd have to bleep here. It was So that's about half the new milestones, you get the idea. Up next is coffee, that bitter brown beverage that everyone but me seems to love. I'm not judging, I just don't get it. But that won't stop me from selling it to you on your way to dinner, which is just what happens here. With this module, you add the baristas, who produce coffee, which in this game is neither food nor drink, but is instead a secret third thing, which means it doesn't trigger any milestones except for this new one. However, in the most unrealistic choice of this entire game, coffee can't be marketed. So the way that you'll sell it is by making coffee shops that customers pass by on their way to eat somewhere else. First off, let's make a shop. This happens every time you train up a barista or barista trainee to a higher level. If you went from trainee to normal type, it can go two distance by road from a restaurant. Or if you made a lead barista, the coffee shop can go anywhere as long as it's still roadside. 
Coffee shops have entrances on all four sides, and if you run out and need to build another, you can move an existing one. Now, during dinner time, when a customer goes to a restaurant, if the shortest route passes by a coffee shop, they'll buy one coffee, provided you have one available. And the price for it is whatever your unit price is, with all modifiers applying as normal. If there are multiple shortest routes, they'll take the one that gets them the most coffee. If there are multiple coffee shops along the way, they'll buy one at each. But if there are multiple shortest routes that are equally caffeinated, they'll actually skip all coffee shops along the contested portions. Also, when I talk about shortest routes, I'm referring to map tiles. The literal length of the roads doesn't matter, so this would be fine. And lastly, during cleanup, coffee can't be stored in a freezer, so it always goes away. And if someone got the coffee milestone, they get to place a coffee shop at unlimited range. So those two are recommended for your first game, but we've got plenty more to cover. Up next are a bunch that will be a lot quicker to teach. So all the modules we're about to cover are individually pretty easy to add into a game. And I'm going to start with the ones that mostly just affect setup before getting into the more gameplay focused mods. We'll start with a six player mode. This is the same game, but this copy included enough cards and tokens along with bigger goods tokens count as fives to play with six players. You'll build a four by six map and because that means you'll need more tiles than the base game came with, this expansion has provided some new ones. You can add these in regardless of player count, but some of these new tiles are also a little different, so let's take a quick look. These three you can probably work out on your own. Just know that this road stops here, so you can't trace a route through this house. These two tiles have apartment buildings. Since apartments house so many people, these buildings gain double the demand from each campaign and can hold an unlimited number of demand. This apartment will trigger between houses 9 and 10, and this one is number pi, which of course has a value of 3.14159265358979323846 and so on, you know it. So it's between 3 and 4. Apartments can't have a garden, however they do interact with parks, but I'm going to talk about that and this parks tile when we get to lobbyists in the next section. Next up we have reserve prices and hard choices. Reserve prices is an alternate set of reserve cards that don't change the amount of money in the bank or the number of CEO slots you have. Instead, they change the unit price of all products. Same as before, these activate when the bank breaks the first time and the most common choice is selected, or the higher price if tied. Hard choices is what we've already seen with the new milestones, so this is just where you'll place the markers on the old set. As we've seen, these milestones will go away after the second or third turn, even if no one has claimed them, which in my opinion will probably make things a bit easier for first time players who might not know the best opening moves. So those are the setup mods. Let's change some gameplay, starting with the titular catch-up mechanism. This is basically just a new milestone that you'll get if another player sells to a house that has demand on it that one of your ad campaigns placed. And if multiple players place demand on the house, they can all get the milestone based on the same stolen sale. The reward is a minus one to distance, which works just like the first marketeer milestones reward, and they do stack if you have both. People will put ketchup on or in anything, so this works no matter what good you're selling. And you might think that this won't actually help people catch up, since this is likely to happen early in the game, and you can and probably will want to engineer it, and to that I say, splatter. Next up, we've got a batch of new employees that do all kinds of things. Starting with the fry chefs, these train up from any cook, but now instead of making food, for every house you sell to, you'll gain an extra 10 bucks per fry chef. This doesn't affect the unit price or anything like that, it's just a fixed amount that you add on after the sale. Now, if fries are too lowbrow for you, first off, get over yourself, fries are delicious. Second off, you might want the gourmet food critic. This marketeer gets trained up from a marketing trainee and places these guidebook marketing tiles near the map. These advertise to all houses with a garden, but otherwise work just like any other marketing tile. Our next employee is living the American dream. Any waitress can now be trained into a movie star, just like we always, just like they always wanted. You can choose which one you want, but you should take the best available. So B, then C, then D. And this whole set is like one type of unique card. So if you have the B star, you can't get the C or D star. Also, when setting up, if playing with four players, remove the D star, and for three players, remove the C as well. There are also extras, but you will never use these. It's just a quirk of the printing process. Now, movie stars no longer make you any money like waitresses do, but they're better at breaking ties during dinner time. Regardless of the number of waitresses, whoever has the best movie star shilling their junk food will win the tiebreaker. 
On top of that, whoever has the best movie star also gets first choice at the turn order, regardless of how many open slots they have. And the last employee to talk about is the night shift manager. These are entry-level employees, so you can hire them directly, but they do take a salary. As managers, they can only report to a CEO, but they don't actually have any slots. They also can't be trained, and they're unique, so you can only have one. What they do is allow all non-salaried employees to trigger twice, making it a little more viable to play without trainers in your structure. And that's all for the easy stuff. Up next, we've got a few Asian-inspired dishes, new marketing techniques, and governmental manipulation. Yeah, that tracks. Let's take a look. So let's start with one of my least favorite elements of the American political system, lobbyists. In the real world, they're often a blight on democracy. In this game, they make parks and roads. Sure. Basically, this module adds the lobbyist employee, who can be hired directly but still pulls a salary. When they activate, which takes place between steps 5 and 6 of the working phase, they can place one road or park within range 2 along an existing road. Since we caught a glimpse of them earlier, let's start with the parks. Parks are similar to gardens in that when a house or apartment is adjacent to one, they'll pay double for any goods they buy. This kind of stacks with gardens because if a house has both, they'll pay triple. Being adjacent to two parks doesn't provide any additional bonus though. The garden counts as part of the house, so this would be considered adjacent. And also, unlike gardens, parks don't affect how much demand a house can hold. Lobbyists can also build roads. These must be adjacent to a road square in range of your restaurant, or adjacent to your restaurant's entrance, and will do exactly what you'd expect. But the construction takes a turn to complete, so you place the road on its under construction side. This also creates traffic, so for each bit of existing road that this new one points to, place one of these roadworks tiles. The new road can't be used until it's finished, but customers can drive over the roadworks tiles. They just add one to the distance, meaning you can use them aggressively, even if you don't care about the actual road. And then of course, during cleanup, you flip the roads over and remove the roadworks tiles. Roads and parks are both limited in supply, so if you run out, you won't be able to produce any more. And lastly, this module includes a lobbyist milestone, which lets you place an additional map tile from the unused ones in the box. It has to be fully aligned with another tile, so it can't hang over an edge. And you can't cover an airplane campaign or freeway off-ramp. More on that one later. Other than that though, there aren't really any placement restrictions, and whatever's on the new tile immediately comes into play. If multiple players get this milestone, they place in turn order. But if you're playing a six player game or a five player without any of the other new tiles, you might run out before placing everything and that sucks, deal with it. Anyway, that's all for lobbyists. Let's move on to the new marketeers. Mass marketeers and rural marketeers don't have to be added together, but they're similar enough that I'm covering them back to back before finishing with the new food. Mass marketeers are here to flood the city with demand. They're promoted from marketing trainees, and each one played by any player will add another marketing phase to the round. So if three mass marketeers were played, you're getting four marketing phases. The phases will run as normal, but you only remove one duration token from each campaign, regardless of how many times it repeats. And make sure to do the entire phase, running each campaign before starting over, because it could easily happen that houses start filling up with demand before you're done. Rural marketeers are a little weirder. If you're playing with these employees, who also get promoted from marketing trainees, you first place this rural area tile near the board. This represents all of the rural neighborhoods that are near the city, but not quite within it. When you play a rural marketeer, you get to place a giant billboard filling one side of the rural area. As it says on the tile, marketing yields double the demand and the capacity for demand is infinite. Giant billboards also last forever, so the marketeer will be busy for the rest of the game. The rural area can be thought of as a big house that eats last during dinner time, but because they live out in the boonies, in order to get to your restaurant, they'll need to take the freeway. This new milestone lets whoever gets it place a freeway off-ramp adjacent to a map tile so that it connects to an existing road. You'll count distance from any of these tiles, but know that there are only three of them, so if a lot of people get the milestone and you run out while placing, tough luck for the fourth player. Also, when placing the off-ramp, it can't cover up an airplane campaign. Now that's all you need to know about the new marketeers, and I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. So let's look at the new food. We've got three new dishes to serve up, noodles, sushi, and kimchi. You can add them all or pick and choose, and they each work a little differently, but one thing they all have in common is that you don't market them. They'll get purchased in slightly different ways. 
Also, if you play with any of these new foods, add one luxuries manager. Anyway, let's talk about noodles. These are made by noodle cooks and chefs who come up from kitchen trainees, and true to reality, noodles are always a good backup option. This means that if a house can't find what it's actually demanding, if you have noodles, it'll buy those instead. You can't mix and match, so in this example, even though you have a burger, you'll need to have three noodles, one for each of their demand, in order to sell to this house. When selling, they follow the same unit price calculation as any other food or drink. They also count as food for the purpose of milestones and can be stored in the freezer. Up next, we have sushi, which is made by sushi cooks and chefs who also train up from kitchen trainees. This is kind of the opposite of noodles, in that houses will always prefer sushi over their original demand, but sushi will only be bought by houses with gardens. If an accessible restaurant has enough sushi to cover a garden house's demand, it'll go there over anywhere else, with any ties being broken following normal rules. As with noodles, sushi counts as food for milestones and can be stored in the freezer. And lastly, we have kimchi. Yep, looks just like it. Kimchi is made by kimchi masters, who can be directly recruited, but require a salary and are 1x cards, so you can only have one. They'll produce one kimchi per round, but because kimchi is fermented, it takes a bit longer, and so you'll get this bit of cabbage at the end of the cleanup phase, after other food has been discarded. Now, kimchi is something that people will buy, but it's more of a bonus food. They'll never have demand for kimchi, but if a restaurant can meet their demands and also has kimchi, they'll prefer that restaurant to one that doesn't, and will buy one kimchi as well. Again, follow normal tiebreaker rules if multiple restaurants have kimchi and whatever else they need. Kimchi follows normal unit price rules, and it can be stored in the freezer, but, and I'm going to be as delicate as I can here, it has a distinct smell, and so if you do have it in the freezer, you can't store anything else there. Now, if you're playing with two or three of these new foods, the priority can get a little confusing, especially with kimchi. Basically, kimchi has priority over everything, so houses will go to kimchi and sushi before kimchi and normal stuff, before kimchi and noodles, and then that same order without the kimchi. But with that, we've covered every module in the Ketchup Expansion. I hope this helps you get it to the table, and I want to give a shout out to all my Patreon backers who are watching this a month before anybody else. If you want early access to stuff like this, access to the polls, or monthly newsletters, consider becoming a rules lawyer. Either way, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!